So this lesson is going to cover endocarditis and pericarditis, which are both conditions that affect the heart. Now, if we dissect these words into their parts, like all medical terminology, we can easily figure out what they are. So you see both of them have itis. So that means inflammation. They both have card, which means uh, heart, refers to the heart. Okay. And then endo means inside and peri means around. So what we're going to see is endocarditis is inflammation inside the heart and pericarditis is inflammation around the heart. Okay. So let's start with endocarditis. By definition, endocarditis is inflammation of the inner lining and the valves of the heart. So you can see here in this cross section of the heart how just how like inflamed and red the inner lining of the heart is. Um, and you can also see this bacterial vegetation building up on these valves. So that's clumps of like platelets, uh, white blood cells, and other immune cells that are just building up and clumping and getting stuck to these valves. So already you could just picture how difficult it's going to be for this heart and these valves to work correctly, right? So some of the things that cause endocarditis are going to be IV drug use. Just think about those IV drug users on the street, and that's a lot of bacteria being introduced directly into the bloodstream. And we talked in valve disorders about how patients who receive valve replacements are at risk. I mean, keep in mind, that's a foreign object, and it's just asking for bacteria to collect on those valves and on that uh, mechanical valve. Um, then what we see with endocarditis is this huge connection to oral health and uh, dental procedures. It seems kind of silly, but the evidence has shown that bacteria travels from the mouth to the heart really easily. So people who've had dental procedures or have an abscessed tooth, they'll come in with chest pain, and as it turns out, it's actually endocarditis. So we also even teach our patients to avoid dental procedures for a while. So as you saw in that image, you can imagine having all that inflammation and vegetation on the valves mean they're not going to work right. So sometimes they'll struggle to close all the way. Um, so you'll see regurgitation. And sometimes they don't open all the way because of the vegetation that's in the way. And so that's stenosis. But the most important thing to note here is that those vegetations um, can actually break off and become embolic. Remember, emboli are things that break off and travel through the veins or through the vessels. Um, so they can travel and they can get stuck somewhere and that causes ischemia. So the three big complications of this would be stroke, MI, and pulmonary embolisms or PEs. Okay. Um, so keep an eye out for those. And then as far as just regular symptoms, of course, this is an infectious process. So you're going to see fevers. You're going to see an increased white blood cell count. Um, if they have any valve involvement, you're going to hear heart murmurs. You can refer back to the valve disorders lesson to learn more about that. Um, and then because they're having issues pumping, you can actually see signs of heart failure and low cardiac output. So they might be pale. They might have a low blood pressure, et cetera. Um, and then the big thing is those embolic complications. So aside from the big three, there's a couple other things we might see. One of those is splinter hemorrhages in the nail beds. So if this is their finger and this is their fingernail, um, splinter hemorrhages are actually little um, streaks of blood that you'll see within the nail bed that are caused by uh, these emboli going down into the periphery. Um, you may also see Janeway lesions, which are uh, bruises on the hands and the feet, and then clubbing of fingers because of that decreased oxygen to the tissues. So you can see how this affects not just the heart, but also the whole body as well. So what do we do for endocarditis? Well, first and foremost, we have to treat the infection. So we're going to give uh, antibiotics, and they may even go home with a PICC line so that they can have six weeks worth of antibiotics. This is a long-term treatment to really make sure we kill everything off. We also stress oral hygiene again because of that connection we talked about between oral health and endocarditis. Then we're going to apply uh, anti-embolic stockings or SCDs. And the provider may even order uh, anticoagulants like heparin or Lovenox. 
And the purpose of that is just to prevent uh, more clots. Obviously, we don't want to cause any more problems than they already have. Um, and then, of course, infection control. We're going to be both looking for signs and symptoms of infection, but also infection precautions. And the big thing there is always hand washing. And then we also want to educate the patient and their family on both of those as well. Um, so as a nurse, we get to monitor for these complications, and it's nice to, to really see them start to responding to those antibiotics. So that is endocarditis. So now let's look at pericarditis. Remember we said it's inflammation around the heart. So by definition, it's actually inflammation of the lining around the heart called the pericardial sac. Okay, so you can see the heart sits in this pericardial sac. It's like a little baggie. It's nice and flexible. It's got a little bit of a fluid cushion you can see here. Um, and the heart is protected that way. So when this baggie gets inflamed, it starts to fill with fluid and it swells up and it gets really stiff. It stops being flexible. And that fluid cushion actually starts to put pressure onto the heart itself. The more pressure, the harder it is to, for the heart to fully contract and relax effectively. Now, pericarditis is also caused by an infectious source. Um, it can be fungal, even though that's less common. It's uh, bacterial, it can be bacterial, and it could also be viral. One of the common viruses we actually see causing pericarditis, especially in children, is the Coxsackie virus. But honestly, anyone is susceptible um, to getting this infection and getting pericarditis. Now, I mentioned that the more inflamed the pericardium and that fluid buildup put lots of pressure on the heart, and so it becomes harder and harder for the heart to pump. So you might see signs of heart failure, which um, could potentially even develop into cardiogenic shock, which I'll talk about in a later lesson. And then you may also see cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade happens when the pressure on the heart is so great that the heart can no longer beat effectively um, because it can't fully contract and relax by itself, okay? So what you might see in a patient with pericarditis, again, this is an infectious source. You may see a fever and increased white blood cells. We'll also see those signs and symptoms of heart failure and low cardiac output. Um, and then we will also see chest pain. These patients are going to be in a lot of pain because of that inflammation and the irritation that's being caused by uh, that inflamed pericardial sac. Now, the other thing that we could potentially see is cardiac tamponade. Again, that's when the pressure is so high on the heart that it can't beat effectively. One of the symptoms is a triad of symptoms called Beck's triad. Now, remember, when the heart's not pumping effectively forward, where does that blood go? Well, it usually backs up into their body, and so we may see this JVD. Remember, that's when this jugular vein uh, is swollen within their neck, and it's popping out like a rope in their neck. Um, you'll also see their blood pressure drop because, again, the heart can't pump. And the heart sounds will actually be muffled because of all that fluid that's building up around the heart. It's more difficult to hear the pumping um, and hear the closing of those valves. Now, the other things you might see are pulsus paradoxus, which is when the blood pressure drops when they take a deep breath, so on inspiration. And then you also may see the pulse pressure narrow. Remember, again, pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic. So as those numbers get closer and closer together, it's evidence that the heart can't really fully relax and contract like it should. So what do we do for pericarditis? Well, if it's bacterial, we want to give IV antibiotics. But of course, if it's viral, we may just have to support the symptoms. Um, so we may also see things like anti-inflammatory medications like steroids or NSAIDs. Um, we want to manage their pain because they are definitely going to have chest pain. Um, a lot of times it's worse with breathing or coughing or um, sometimes lying flat can make it worse because all those things are going to put extra pressure on the heart. So we need to make sure we're managing this because they're going to have difficulty with oxygenation because of fluid in their lungs or this pressure around their heart. We want to administer O2 and we want to put them in high Fowler's position um, to make sure that they can breathe well. And also, again, it takes pressure off the heart and decreases their pain. 
Now, if they do experience a cardiac tamponade, we need to prep them for what's called a pericardiocentesis. A surgeon will actually come with a large, long needle, and he'll use ultrasound to guide him, and he will stick it in to the pericardium, and he will drain off the fluid from around the heart. Remember that the heart is now in this swollen, inflamed baggie full of fluid. So we got to drain the fluid so it can pump more freely. Now, a lot of times when we do this, we'll actually see almost immediate relief of symptoms when we start to drain this fluid. It's actually pretty cool. Now, there's a care plan for each of these conditions attached to this lesson, but the major nursing concepts are the same. Perfusion, because we could see how both conditions can decrease cardiac output. Infection control to prevent infection as well as to treat it. And health promotion, they need to know what behaviors to avoid, including avoiding dental procedures for six months. They need to know uh, signs and symptoms of infection and emboli and other things that they might need to report to their provider. And overall, really just how to prevent it from happening again. So let's recap. Endocarditis is inflammation of the inner lining and valves of the heart. Pericarditis is inflammation of the outer lining around the heart. Uh, symptoms are common. You're still going to see signs and symptoms of infection as well as decreased cardiac output in both as well as chest pain and pericarditis. We want to treat the cause. So that would be IV antibiotics. And we'll also support with anti-inflammatory meds as needed. We want to prevent complications. The big complications here besides further infection are going to be those embolic complications. So we want to give anticoagulants. We're going to prevent further infection by giving prophylactic antibiotics and avoiding dental work. And then again, if they do develop tamponade, we want to prep them for the pericardiocentesis. Now, health promotion and education are super important. Again, patients need to understand signs and symptoms of infection and emboli, and they need to know what precautions to take and what to report to their providers. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.